Hey everybody, it's time for another RAV4 Hybrid towing video. What, what, what was that? More excitement? It's time for RAV4 Hybrid towing podcast. Was that better? Anyway, in all seriousness, uh, we are doing this video because we had a number of questions the last time we towed with the RAV4. Obviously, that towing route was very hill specific. We went from sea level to 2200 feet and around in a big circle there. That's not what everybody out there does when they're towing. So in this towing test, we're gonna be doing a long highway run. We're gonna be doing over 200 miles of relatively level towing at highway speeds, probably about, uh, my estimation about 150 miles or so collectively of level highway driving. We're gonna do it in chunks. So we're gonna do 100 miles, then we're gonna fill up the car again, calculate the real world mileage. A lot of people were wanting to know that. This uh, trip computer has been very accurate in the past, but we're gonna do that for you again. And then we are going to take this up to 7,000 feet, actually a little over 7,500 feet in total elevation. For those of you that are paying attention, this elevation change is actually pretty similar to what we see TFL car and TFL truck doing out there in Colorado. Just a high there to my friends over at TFL car. Roman, however, is starting that test at about 5,000 feet and then going up about 7,000 feet from there. But here in California, I don't have to start at 5,000 feet. So we're starting at sea level and going up to over 7,000 feet, but a very similar test overall. The trailer right here behind me has a dry weight of about 1,600 pounds, and then we have 400 pounds of gear in it. So we're putting 2,000 pounds behind this 1,750 pound rated RAV4. Now, why are we going a little bit over the rating? Well, for one, this trailer has electric brakes, so that's gonna make that a little bit safer. And the second and most important thing is that here in California, our maximum towing speed limit is 55 miles an hour. And towing trailer stability is a function of vehicle speed, tongue weight, etc. So we have this vehicle properly set up. We have 10% of the trailer weight on the tongue, and the only major difference is the weight behind, but we're gonna be towing at lower speeds. Again, 55 miles an hour is the maximum speed limit here. We will be pushing that a little bit. We're probably going about 60 miles an hour to keep up with the rest of the trailer towing traffic, and of course, big rigs. And then of course, the big reason that we're doing the extra weight is because a lot of you wanted us to. They wanna know how will this perform going uphill? And that brings me to the third and most critical component of this test, data logging. Modern vehicles, this RAV4 hybrid included, log an awful lot of data. So we can tell how hot the motors are getting, how hot the battery is getting, what the cooling loop is like, what the inverter temperatures are like in there, etc. All that is gonna be data logged, and then we're going to go ahead and dissect that data after we get back from our 440 mile round trip towing odyssey, and then we'll see how we do. Let's talk about the drive route first. We'll be starting out in Santa Cruz County, about 10 miles from the Pacific Ocean, at an elevation of about 1,100 feet overall. We'll cross California's coastal range, heading on into Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is just at about sea level, only about 20 or 30 feet or so. We'll then go up two minor mountain passes over the Diablo Range. We'll then be crossing over towards the outer reaches of the San Francisco Bay. This particular area is the Carquinas Straits, which is a subset of San Francisco Bay itself. We'll then be traveling on right at about sea level for quite a distance because Sacramento is about 100 miles from our start point, but Sacramento itself is only about 20 or 30 feet above sea level. Once we pass through the outskirts of Sacramento and of course past Auburn, California, we are well and truly in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And this is where we're gonna be rapidly climbing from about a thousand feet or so all the way on up to over 7,200 feet at the summit. At the summit, we have Donner Pass and of course nearby Donner Lake because rather unfortunately, the Donner Party met an untimely end there in the middle of the winter. Total driving distance is about 240 miles going clear across California from the coast all the way up to nearly the Nevada border. It's time to get out on the road. We've completed our first 30 miles of the journey. So far, we've averaged 21.3 miles per gallon. 
And uh, fear not, I am all decked out with our supplies here for this journey. I have my uh, surgical masks, I have my hand sanitizer, Kleenex, paper towels, uh, bag of gloves for fill up. So fear not, all social norms will be observed at this time. Um, and we're not gonna stop out uh, anywhere for food. I have snacks and supplies stuffed everywhere in the RAV4. So this is uh, all about the numbers. Don't worry about anything else. And again, our first stop is gonna be at the gas station so we can get a good clean fill. Now I know a lot of people have been asking this ad nauseum, non-stop every time we have a RAV4 hybrid video. No, we have never had an issue with the RAV4 completing a fill up at the gas station. This has always had a complete tank every time we've left. I honestly don't know exactly what's going on with the fill up issues that some people have reported with the RAV4 hybrid. Absolutely has not affected this particular model. I suspect it has something to do with the individual stations and the nozzle and the way that they interact with the filler tube in the RAV4. Some of the auto shutoff mechanisms out there may be more sensitive than others. And also remember that here in California, we have vapor recovery nozzles. Those are a little bit different than the ones they use in other states that may play into this a little bit. But bottom line, we have uh, 11,000 miles on the RAV4 hybrid at this point in time, and we have never had an issue giving it a complete fill. Alrighty, we have now filled up the tank and uh, it took 10.6 gallons. So we will stop at the next place, put uh, however many gallons it takes until the filler nozzle is full. I could actually see the level of gasoline in the filler nozzle, so I do know that it was definitely full. And uh, let's get this party started here. Backing up a trailer with the RAV4 is pretty easy because the wheelbase is so short it's really easy to get the trailer to do exactly what you want it to do. And then you can turn off the parking sensors and the rear emergency braking separately from one another. That's a feature that I like. I do wish you could turn off the front and rear parking sensors independently. I like the front parking sensors being on and that's why I was putting up with the beeping in the back. But I do have the rear emergency braking turned off and that's a nice feature and it will stay off until you turn it back on, even including power cycles, something we didn't see, for instance, in the Nissan Titan pickup truck. Two hours into our drive, we are now at about 136 miles or so, and we're in Sacramento, California. Our elevation at this point is 36 feet above sea level. You can drive an awful long way in California and still stay right near sea level. In fact, interesting point of trivia, the Sacramento River that's in Sacramento is still tidally influenced this far inland. Now, the big deal here is that we've gone over a 1,000 foot mountain pass in order to get here, so not a terribly steep one, but a little bit of elevation change. We've been averaging 20.6 miles per gallon overall. I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with that. Some folks out there might say, gosh, that's an awful lot of a drop for something that's rated at 40 miles per gallon. But remember, we've doubled the number of axles. This is a twin axle trailer, so we now have eight tires going down the road. And of course, we have 2,000 pounds in that trailer, and that trailer is far less aerodynamic than this RAV4 right here. So overall, I have to admit that 20.6 MPG is pretty decent overall. Now that does mean that our overall range on this gas tank is gonna be somewhere around maybe about 300 miles rather than about 500 miles like you would normally expect. Before we leave Sacramento, I'm gonna go ahead and stop, fill the tank completely full, and we'll see what our fuel economy really has been. And actually, according to this, 5.755 gallons, let me do the math again, because. Uh, I think we're incorrect here. So we drove 120 miles on this tank, uh, 0.1, 120.1 divided by 5.755 gallons, which means actually the trip odometer in this RAV4 is a little bit pessimistic. It says 20.6 MPG, but according to the numbers game here, 20.86. And again, yes, we did get a complete fill here, just in case you're wondering, filled it up till I could actually see the gasoline in the filler neck and uh, spot on. So towing 2,000 pounds, going 63 miles an hour, according to the speedometer on the car, according to the GPS, exactly 60 miles per hour. We averaged uh, 20.6 miles per gallon. That's not half bad. And now's when the fun really begins. We're just outside of Auburn, California, which means we're just over 1,000 feet above sea level and elevation. And we're in the Sierra Nevada foothills. So we're gonna have a lot of rolling foothills, 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet, up and down and up and down. And then we're gonna have some relatively steep passes as we go all the way on up to Donner Summit, which is just over 7,000 feet in elevation. And I can just about see the Sierra Nevada over there in the distance. 
Interesting point of trivia, if you're not from California, Sierra Nevada is already plural. So you don't say Sierra Nevadas or Nevadas because in Spanish, Sierra Nevada Mountains is already plural. So uh, there you go. If you didn't know that, now you know something else. We're at 2,700 feet, so we got a long way to go till we get to the top of this thing. But you can see that we do have uh, motor temperatures that have gone over 200 degrees at this point. So things are definitely starting to cook and things are definitely more of a torture test than our original towing over Highway 17 in California. Now, when we take a look at the coolant temperature, you'll notice that that's just over 200 degrees at its peak over most of these longer uphill runs. And that means that everything is definitely okay. So we're still able to pull that heat out of the engine, out of the electric motors, dissipate it through the radiator and cool off those components effectively. A lot of folks have been asking about battery and inverter temperature. Neither of those components have gone over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, mainly because of the way that they're used. In these long uphill stretches, the battery really isn't being used. We use up some of the battery. It stays at a relatively low state of charge, but there's still some oomph in there if you really needed to punch it for a passing maneuver or something. Uh, looks like Toyota's done a really great job as far as battery management and managing that state of charge. We've now hit an area where we have a much steeper grade and we're now starting to pass some of these semis that are going, it looks like about 45, 40 miles an hour up these steeper grades. RAV4 so far just clinging right on here. We're almost at 4,000 feet so far and uh, still going 60 miles an hour according to the GPS right there. That's our most accurate speed. It is interesting, and I have to comment on this, that the car's odometer here thinks that we're going 64 and the cruise control is set to 64, but the car on OBD2 says 60 miles an hour and that matches what the GPS is saying. So the car is fully aware of how fast it's really going, but the speedometer and the cruise control are a little bit conservative there in their overall estimate. I just passed 4,900 feet and we are on one of these really long uphill sections here, probably about in the middle of it. And uh, again, the RAV4 is still doing really, really well. Overall battery state of charge is still hovering right around 40% or so. And that means that if I dig into the throttle, there is just a little bit more power that the vehicle can give us. And we can still even accelerate in some of these uphill stretches. So even if you were climbing up this hill, with the 2,000 pounds on the back, uh, and you can see it didn't drain the battery that far, um, you can actually still hit the throttle, you can still accelerate to pass someone if you needed to, if you want to just pass them a little bit more rapidly and then gap back in the right lane where you're supposed to be. Just past 5,700 feet now, so we have definitely lost a reasonable amount of power from a naturally aspirated engine up at these higher altitudes but it still feels relatively peppy thanks to the electric motors and that battery reserve that we still have there. So you can still call on some of that. Now remember, this is not a plug-in hybrid vehicle. It's not a battery electric vehicle, so we don't have that much oomph out of the battery, but every little bit helps up here. And you can definitely feel that addition of torque from the electric motor. We just crossed 7,000 feet. And as you can see, the transmission is still humming along at 220 degrees, which is an okay temperature for a transmission to be especially when you're towing heavier loads. It's not really uh, gonna be a problem with transmission fluid lifetime if you're not doing it all that often. And even if you were doing it very regularly, just follow a heavier duty transmission fluid replacement cycle and you should be fine. So overall, things have definitely been very good. And I think we're gonna hit the peak up here. Uh, we're gonna hit Donner Summit with absolutely no problem. And fortunately, it's not snowing outside, so I won't have to eat anybody else in the car. If you're not clear what I'm talking about, just Wikipedia Donner Party, that's not the party you wanna get invited to. With the uphill portion down and our trip economy meter reading 17.6 uh, miles per gallon since we started this morning, it's now time to begin our downhill trek all the way back down to sea level and then of course all the way up the other mountain pass on the way home. As I noted the last time I towed with the RAV4 Hybrid, downhill performance is an awful lot better than I had expected and I would argue, oddly enough, better than the non-hybrid RAV4. And that's because this can give us engine braking and essentially an infinite number of ratios between the wheels and the engine for that engine braking. Now that's not because we have a CVT, because again, this does not have a transmission in the traditional sense. Instead, we have a hybrid system that's based around one planetary gear set and two motor generator units. The motor generator units can power the wheels, start the engine. They can also effectively control the ratio mechanically between the wheels and the engine. And that mechanically part is important because this vehicle can send most of the engine's power to the wheels mechanically rather than electrically, rather than generating power and then running an electric motor. And it can also do the reverse, sending that power going down the hill mechanically and spinning the engine to consume it in essence. 
Now that's really important because on these longer downhill slopes, you are going to reach a point where the battery is completely filled and you will no longer get any regenerative braking. So all you have left is engine braking and of course friction braking from the vehicle's brakes. But I have to say that so far we've come down about 3,300 feet. So we've come down more than halfway down this hill and the battery is only barely at about 70, 80%. Now that is of course because I have this huge aerodynamic drag behind me. And even on these downhill slopes, if I take my foot off the accelerator pedal, I may sometimes start slowing down because the trailer is just so large. Remember that our fuel economy figures and the overall performance that we're talking about here is certainly hampered by the aerodynamic profile of that trailer. So we've now stopped for gas again in Sacramento on our way back home and our fuel economy average has really fallen through the floor. So according to the numbers here, we have averaged 12.5 miles per gallon. That's because of the massive amount of gasoline that of course it took us to get from sea level up to over 7,000 feet. Now the trip fuel computer here in the car is a little bit more optimistic than that overall total. It thinks that our average has dropped down to about 14 miles per gallon. So it is surprising that it was so accurate out on the highway, but its overall average, and this is again the entire trip average from our entire beginning, uh, seems to have fallen apart a little bit. Hopefully we will recover some of that average by the time we get all the way back to the Bay Area. Some folks out there are awfully surprised when hybrids get low fuel economy when towing, but remember, it takes an awful lot of energy to get a heavy weight up a hill at highway speeds. Now the hybrid system likely still had a fuel economy benefit, but a lot of it is masked in the low numbers that we're talking about when towing. So for instance, a five to 10% improvement in fuel economy down here near single digits is just not going to be as statistically obvious as a five to 10% improvement up at 30 or 40 miles per gallon. So how did the hybrid perform? Well, honestly, better than many people would expect a hybrid to perform. Going up to 7,300 feet from sea level, absolutely no problem. Some of those steeper grades on Interstate 80, absolutely no problem at all. Passing big rigs with a 2,000 pound trailer behind, again, absolutely no problem. And remember that that trailer is 250 pounds heavier than the rated tow capacity of this RAV4 right here. We also had absolutely no overheating issues at all. The motors definitely stayed within their overall specifications. Complete round trip, 442 miles, we ended up at 17 miles per gallon average, which honestly is stellar for any vehicle towing a trailer with that kind of aerodynamic profile. And remember, again, up and over several mountain passes, a 2200 foot one where I am, one that's about 1800 feet, then the rolling foothills of the Sierra Nevada, and then all the way on up to 7300 feet. Definitely lots of energy being consumed by this little engine right here. So this is significantly more efficient than doing that same run with a larger non-hybrid SUV out there. And it also impressed in terms of its ability to keep the speed under control when we're going back down the hill on the other side. Now let's take a look at some of the data we collected. With the driving done, it's time to pour over the data. Now remember that the focus here was primarily on motor and inverter temperature, the two things that most of you out there said you were concerned about when towing heavier loads with your Toyota Hybrid. The main reason for that is the way that Toyota's hybrid systems operate. They're designed around a single planetary gear set. Now, the system that's used in the current generation RAV4 and current generation Highlander is a little bit more complicated than that. It's an off-axis system, so there's a little bit more going on than just one planetary gear set, but the concept remains essentially the same. According to some estimates out there, about 80% of the power goes from the engine to the wheels mechanically, and then the remainder is power that is generated by MG1 and then shuttled across to MG2, and then MG2 is providing that basically extra 20% of torque driving down the road. And this number will change around depending on exactly what the drivetrain needs to do. If more torque is required, then generally speaking, more power is going through this path because the motors can produce a great deal of low end torque. When you're using motors in this way, the generator unit is gonna get warm, so is the motor unit, and of course the inverter, which is controlling the whole process, is gonna get warm as well. The big thing to know about this kind of transmission is that the motors and the inverters are water-cooled in Toyota's hybrid systems. So it's not that these motors are depending on splashing around in the transmission fluid. So when we're talking about temperatures here, remember that we're not talking about transmission fluid temperatures. I didn't have the transmission temperature in the screen grab that we were recording while we were driving. However, I did have it in the data logging and the maximum transmission fluid temperature essentially mirrored the engine coolant temperature. It was about 210 degrees Fahrenheit or so. So definitely within an acceptable range for a modern automatic transmission. 
Part of that is because there's less going on inside this transmission than there is in a regular automatic transmission. So most likely the heat was actually coming from the coolant loop that is inside the radiator. So the engine's coolant being warmer is actually probably what made the transmission fluid warmer. Diving into these numbers, let's go in order. So first, steady state highway travel. Again, we did have that trailer connected to the vehicle. It was 2,000 pounds, but it also had a lot of frontal area, so decent amount of drag. 60 miles an hour, level highway travel, getting just over 20 miles per gallon, so definitely about half as efficient as the vehicle driving down the road all on its own. Two hours in, the inverter finally hit 75 degrees, just 10 degrees above ambient. MG1 and MG2 were hovering around 136 to 138 degrees overall. MGR, that's the motor in the rear, 88 degrees, and the battery, 90 degrees. Remember that the battery pack in the RAV4 is air-cooled. But the key things to know here is that the inverter and the motor generator units were actually well below the temperature of the engine coolant. Now, it's acceptable for a motor to be over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Generally speaking, you want to keep your transmission fluid below about 240 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent premature wear, but definitely everything here is well within operational specs. But now let's talk about when we started to climb the hill. So again, we had no problem actually climbing the hill, had no problem passing, etc. In this testing, maximum temperature occurred at around 5,000 feet, likely because that's where the grades were steeper and we also had warmer exterior temperatures. The grades ranged from about 5 to 6% overall for about 30 miles. These are some pretty steep grades overall. These are actually close to the maximum grades allowed in the interstate highway system. Uh, and temperatures actually started dropping overall on those similar climbs at the very top because we saw a decrease in ambient temperature. 50 degrees at the top, about 70 degrees when we started down at the bottom, 80 degrees for the flat run returns at home, and about 75 or so degrees external uh, in the middle here. At the very peak of this torture test where we had the vehicle at about 80, 90% throttle, we were climbing up that 5,000 uh, feet mark right there, the motor generator units ended up at 234 degrees for MG1, 235 degrees for MG2. But the key thing here is that you could really tell that the coolant loop was really doing its job because MG1, MG2, and the inverter unit all share a coolant loop here. They peaked briefly at 238 degrees Fahrenheit on MG2. When you take a look at the screen grab here, you'll notice the top set at 235. I didn't have the scale set quite as high as I, as I needed to. I thought it would stop at around 230 or so but the maximum peak ended up at 238 according to the data logging. And that was while passing some trucks over there. So it was that, that, that path of the electricity from MG1 to MG2 that was really heating things up. But the big thing you should note here is the inverter temperature, which topped out at just 97 degrees. So the fluid coming out of these units was obviously well over 100 degrees, effectively cooled after going through keeping the inverter down there at 97 degrees. MGR peaked at around 126 degrees and the battery at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The battery cooling fan definitely turned on and you could really hear it whirring around back there because the battery was certainly involved in this process, as was MGR, and that is an important thing to remember. When you're flooring the vehicle up a hill, the vehicle decides to send some of the power to the rear motor. That helps improve overall stability when under full throttle. Obviously, you get a little bit less torque steer up front, but it also has the effect of reducing some of the load on MG2 up front. So the power is coming from either the battery or the motor generator unit up front, but then power being delivered to move the vehicle forward, you can actually reduce some of the heat load up front on that cooling system by sending the power to the rear electric motor and the rear inverter unit back there. And those actually stayed pretty cool all the way around. Then at the return trip, we got very similar temperatures to the trip going up. So even though it was about 10 degrees warmer on the return trip on, again, steady state travel, about 100 miles overall, MG1 and MG2 were again hovering right around 135 to 140 degrees. That seems to be a pretty traditional operating temperature zone for those units. The other thing I noticed when really digging deep into these numbers is that the inverter cooling loop could have been running an awful lot faster as well as the engine's coolant pump. So these two units definitely had much greater capacity available to them. So if you're worried about doing the same kind of test when it was 20, 30 degrees hotter outside, I suspect things would still be okay. I was able to test that out a little bit later when I got home, and I deliberately picked a very steep country road section where I could safely stop, and then I repeatedly stopped and floored the vehicle, stopped and floored the vehicle, stopped and floored the vehicle to try and heat things up as much as possible, and then I definitely got those coolant pumps revving a little bit higher. But in steady state highway travel, your typical situations where you're climbing up a mountain pass, this really had absolutely no problem, and I was definitely over the towing limits of this vehicle for America. 
Remember, the RAV4 is rated for 1,750 pounds in this country. We were towing 2,000 pounds, and we were towing a trailer with a lot of frontal area. Now, if you're going faster, then things are going to be a little bit different. So if you're in an area like, for instance, Colorado, where you could tow a little bit faster, say go 70 miles an hour with a trailer up some of those hills, a, I would argue you shouldn't be doing that with a trailer that's a little bit overweight. You probably want even more weight on the tongue, which would be a problem for the RAV4. It's not rated for that much weight on the tongue, but you would definitely be heating things up a little bit more, a little bit beyond what we saw here. But overall, I have to say the RAV4 executed itself very well.